Happy Father's Day, everybody. Dad jokes, they are the best, right? I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you. Let me say, first of all, uh, my name is Patrick Conrad. I haven't been here in a while, but, uh, but I'm part of the leadership team here at Compel Church, and we are honored that you're here. If you're brand new uh, and you don't know, we are one church in multiple locations, and so we use a combination of video and live in order to display the message at the campuses across DeSoto County, so we are so honored that you are here. By the way, people are joining us at Olive Branch, at South Haven. They're also right here at Hernando. Can we welcome everybody? So we want to welcome you to this incredible weekend and the ladies at God Behind Bars as well as those who are watching online. Uh, I want to tell you uh, personally, thank you so much for the generosity of our board and and yourselves and our leadership done a phenomenal job. While I've been away for a little bit on sabbatical, getting refreshed, getting renewed, getting to read a lot, getting to pray and just sort of contemplate about where Compel Church is going. So thank you for that time alone. It's good to be back with you. I want to welcome you again to an incredible Father's Day weekend. How many of you have already gotten a Father's Day gift? All right, good. Got some socks. Anybody get any underwear? That's what we men love, socks and underwear. But let me tell you, this Father's Day, I got something very, very special. We were in North Carolina, so I went back to see my family in Sanford. 20 miles from Sanford is a little town called Pinehurst, North Carolina. And I got to go to the U.S. Open for one day and just check it out. It was amazing. One of the best Father's Day gifts I've ever gotten. And so we were there Thursday, drove back Friday, uh, tried to get some rest Saturday, and we're here today today. But I had an incredible Father's Day. How many of you at least got your father a card? Come on, you got a card? Very few. Cards are going out, huh? So yeah, there's a a story I heard of a teenager, and I've done this myself, who forgot about Father's Day until Father's Day, ran to Walgreens to try and grab a card, and there was only two cards left. And so he grabbed a card and took it, wrote in it, gave it to his dad, and his dad looked at him after he opened up the card, and, and it said, You've been like a father to me. His dad's like, well, what's the deal? And he said, well, the only other card was now that I'm a father too. And he said, so I figured you probably have this one rather than the other. And his dad said, yeah, that, that probably worked out. But how many of you noticed that, that the, the temperature in the room is a little different on Father's Day than Mother's Day? Right? You notice that we're a little bit more uh, inspirational. It's a little bit more solemn on Mother's Day, right? And, and then Father's Day, we just love to laugh at dads. And, and I don't mind doing that either. I think it's a lot of fun. I'm the butt of most every joke in my home. I get it, and I don't mind dishing it out, right? It's just a lot of fun to laugh and have fun with dads. But I want to talk to you today, as you can look at the top of your handout, about a, a really serious issue, an issue that I want to address today. And this is this idea of the role and the fun function of a father in the home and in our society as a whole. I believe that it needs to be taken a little bit more seriously in the culture in which we live. How many of you know that for many of us, our perspective of men and our perspective as a society of fathers has been shaded by a culture who tells us that the patriarchy is dominant and oppressive and sexist and that men are toxic. This is a popular theme today. And as a result, many of us cannot read the Bible and what it says about men and fathers through the lens of God's word, but instead through the lens of a culture who tries to define it for us. And so I want to talk to you about the role of a father. I want to talk to you about the function of a dad in the home. So dads, Men, fathers, I want to speak to you today about fatherhood in spite of what this culture says about men. I want to talk to you men today despite uh, what you may have even experienced in your own home. Maybe you didn't have a good father experience. And I want to talk to you about what the Bible says in spite of that reality that you faced. I want you to hear what God has to say about fathers from the original the OG, the one who designed fathers and the framework in which fatherhood operates at its best. So despite how sin has marred mankind, causing their yes to be fathers who are hurtful and men who are toxic, that is true. 
What is not true is that that's who men are. That is not true. What is not true is this is how fatherhood and the patriarchy is decidedly is. That is not true. The Bible defines for us what is true and what is not. And at some point, we have to come to the place where we decide to believe the Bible over the culture around us. And so I want to talk to you about it today and ask you to humbly put aside all of the things you hear about fatherhood and the toxicity of masculinity in our society. Just put that aside. Not that it doesn't happen. Not that sin does not exist. But that we want to tune in on what God says about fatherhood and about men so we can get God's role and design for our lives. Amen? So, so let me just tell you, first of all, what God says. And, and let me just say, we believe God's word. Uh, understand we're in this series, and I'm sort of doing a standalone rather than part of the series, but we're doing this series about following God. And, and we believe that the only way to follow God is through his word, what he says. And we believe that God's word is what he says, and it is truth above all else. And so at some point, we have to come to a place where we ask ourselves, is, is, is what I hear about fatherhood and what I hear and perceive through this culture concerning men, is, is that reality or is God's word reality? And you have to define it through the lens of God's word. And so God's word says this in Genesis, that the role of a man is to be a leader and a protector of his family. The Bible says in Corinthians and Ephesians that man is the example of the love that God has for other people and for, in particular, his wife. That just as Christ loved the church, a man is to love his wife and to give up his life for her and to sacrifice for her and to give to his children an example of this beautiful picture of Jesus and the church. The Bible tells us also through the Proverbs that men steward the moral authority in the home through this handling of discipline and instruction. Not that men do this all by themselves, but these are specific roles of the father in the home that we need to pay attention to. Because I'm going to tell you, men, we will be held accountable for the way that God has designed us, not accountable to this world for the way that they have reflected their own misperceived ideas of us. Amen? And so let's, let's look at this today. In fact, what's so interesting is that when you look at how God describes manhood and fatherhood in the Bible, we are finding and have found for generations now studies of sociologists, those who study the society and study things like the framework and the structure of the home and the family and how it operates within the larger society they have studied for years and years to find the very things that God's word says are true. <laughs> They're just confirming what God had already said. But I want you to listen to one such uh, sociologist who's done a number of studies at the University of Rutgers. His name is Dr. Popano. And listen to what he says about fathers. Fathers are far more than just second adults in the home. Involved fathers, nay, near, nay we say Christian fathers, are those who bring positive benefits to their children that no other person is likely to bring. They provide protection and economic support and male role models. They have a parenting style that is significantly different from that of a mother, and that difference is important to the healthy development of the child. In fact, in fact he goes on to say this, that our styles are so different. In other words, he says, fathers love more dangerously. They actually uh, roughhouse with their kids, and they, they, they sort of push them to take more risk. Go ahead, jump. You can jump. Go ahead and do it. I remember when I was training my kids to swim. They were still in their pampers, and they couldn't talk yet. That's when you teach your children how to swim. And so my wife thought it was dangerous and stupid, but I, I thought, baby, baby, swimming isn't an Olympic sport. It's a survival mode. Understand this. So when they were babies and in these little floatable diapers, I was like right in their face as their mouth was open. And, go, and then I'd throw them under. And I'd just wait because, you know, those diapers, they'll come back. And so I'd just wait and they'd come back. And when they came out, I'd like, throw them back. And Teresa's like, what are you doing? I'm like, baby, listen to me. You watch the Olympics and you see these people doing the butterfly you know that stroke, the butt is beautiful. I said, mermaids do that at the end of a Disney movie. Okay, that's why they do it. How much, how likely is it that my son 
will be swimming away from a shark doing the butterfly or doing the freestyle, the men's 50-yard dash. Have you ever seen that? It's like people just fall into a pool and don't know how to swim. They're just screaming and going crazy. I want my son to be more Tarzan than Michael Phillips. <laughs> right? But that's how dads are. We love more dangerously. We encourage our kids to take more risk. In fact, dads, he says, tend to see their child in relation to the world, whereas moms see the world in relation to their child. And that balance is so important to have so that we're raising children who are healthy. And, and what I want you to see is, is, is through the Bible, not just sociologists, I just want you to see that, that the world actually attests to the truisms of God's word, right? But what I want you to see is the irreplaceable role of a father in the home. Nobody else can take their place. Now, I didn't have a dad growing up, so my mom did both roles, okay? She never got remarried, had other people. You've heard me say this before. So by the grace of God, he can do anything. But I'm going to tell you, there's a role that we play as fathers, and it's important that we understand it. Now, this can be overwhelming to men, to dads, because we live in a culture where many times uh, the deck seems to be stacked against us anyway. And so it's hard for us to know. And many dads, when I talk to young fathers in particular, I just don't know. That's what they come with. I just don't understand. I don't know. And what we need is not knowledge. What we need is actual wisdom. And so I love going to the book of Proverbs, one of my favorite books in all of the Bible, the Proverbs. And here's what they are. Proverbs are daily statements of wisdom from a father to his son spoken in ways that are easy to understand. Have you ever read the Proverbs? Do you understand the power of a succinct language and godly common sense from a father to a son? That's what the Proverbs are. And what they do is they teach us wisdom. Now, wisdom is a divine thing. You cannot go to school and get wisdom. You can only, under the direction of God, his spirit, his word, discern wisdom, okay, because it's much deeper than knowledge, in fact, in your handout, the word wisdom is defined as the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding which comes from God. Now, I know every man here wants that. If you're a young father here especially, you want that. You may not have had a good father figure in the home. You may feel like the deck is stacked against you, but I want you to know that God gives us a template. He gives us a way to understand and to gain godly wisdom for our kids. Wisdom doesn't come from the world, wisdom that comes from God. So how do we get it? Well, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, give us the understanding of how to get wisdom. I want you to see on the screen here, starting in verse 1 in the NLT, let's look at what it says. My child, listen to what I say. Now, listen. He's speaking to you and I, fathers, okay? Yes, it's to be passed down to our children, but I first want you to understand, he's saying, I will give you wisdom if you will listen to what I say. I want you to treasure my commands. Treasure them. They're more important than many other noble things in your life. Treasure them. Tune your ears to wisdom. There's so many things, so much nonsense, so much noise out there. You're literally going to have to tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. One of the most difficult things to do in our culture today is to really focus and to concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Cry out. It's a hard thing for a man to do. I need help. I don't know which way to go. I mean, never say that. But he says, cry out for insight. Search for them as you would silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Look at all those descriptors there, men. It says, listen, treasure, tune your ears, concentrate, cry out, search, and seek. You know, I'm convinced that most people don't want wisdom. They, 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 they say they want wisdom, but they, they really don't want wisdom. What they'd rather do is live in the ignorance of assumptions and the shadows of conclusions that other people have drawn about life and other topics. 
Because if they really sought wisdom and gained truth, then they would be responsible for that truth. And most people don't want to be responsible for truth. They want to go with the herd. Whatever, everybody else, I want to Instagram parent. I don't want to parent biblically. I don't want to gain wisdom because then I'm responsible for it. But he says you must search, you must listen, you must treasure, tune. You must seek it like you do hidden treasure. Wow, that may be the most important descriptor. You see, here's what you need to know, fathers, that you as a Christ follower are searching for godly wisdom like a hidden treasure in this world. Now, what does it look like for one person amongst many persons when they are looking for a treasure that no one else knows is hidden? They look pretty foolish, don't they? They have to risk looking for, I'm looking for a treasure that no one can see. Well, you look like an idiot. And many times as fathers who are God-honoring people, you will look foolish compared to the world because you're not looking for what the world is looking for. They're looking for things on the surface. They're looking for knowledge. They're looking for things that, they, that will flee and things that will fade away. They're looking for temporary treasures that they think will satisfy, but they won't. But you're looking for a hidden treasure that is eternal. You are a spirit-led being. You are not of this world, though you are in this world. So there will be times when you will look in those around you. And you will be called out. And you will be ostracized because of the decisions that you make. But you must be a man who searches for wisdom like a hidden treasure. Because look at what verse 5 says. Then you will gain understanding. And then you will know what it means to fear the Lord. And you will gain knowledge. He goes on to say, listen to me and read this on your own. Proverbs chapter 2. Look at the benefits of gaining wisdom. This is what your family needs. Verse 7, it grants the treasure of common sense. Whew. Don't you wish we had that today? And we don't need it in Washington. We need it right here. We need it in your family. But you get a treasure of common sense. Verse 8 says it guards our past. It literally creates guardrails on your life. So you don't have to make difficult decisions. As a Christian, you just don't have to. Your decisions are so much easier because he says in verse nine, he gives us the right direction, literally turns the light onto our path and shows us the exit ramp. You don't have to wonder. In verse 10, he fills us with joy and inner peace. In verse 11, wisdom keeps us safe. Do you know that's what your kids need? They, anytime you do anything that is dangerous, to the family. It is dangerous to them. All of a sudden, something, a dissonance happens in your children's life. What they need to know is that you're safe. What keeps you safe is godly wisdom. Verse 12, it guards our lives from the effects of evil company. Read Proverbs 2. Fathers, this is what we need. This is what our children need. This is what society needs. And our future depends on the fact that we gain this wisdom and pass it on. In fact, the passing on of godly wisdom is so ingrained in God's design and structure for mankind and fatherhood that just before Israel entered into the promised land, God stopped the children of Israel and spoke through Moses to them these words, words that we normally share on parent or family commitment day to our children dedication day is Deuteronomy chapter six, verses five through nine. And I want you to see this in your handout. But listen to what he says here, and then we'll break it down to, to, to sort of hit these job description of fatherhood. He says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up and tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. God's word is wisdom and it is timeless and it must be ingrained in you before it's ever passed through you to your children. Now listen to what these job descriptions are. I want you to put them in your handout. Fathers, this is the most important thing that we can do. And I really want you, if you're a young father, or if you're a grandfather who's about to have uh, grandkids or have grandkids, you have a young, teach this to your son so he can teach it to his sons. The number one job description that your family needs, that your spouse needs, 
And I say this irregardless of what your situation is. Well, you don't understand. She's about to leave me. We're in financial mess. My kids hate me. Doesn't matter. You cannot go back and replace the past decision. What you can do is get your head wrapped around God's word and get God's word wrapped up in your heart and change the future. And so right now, understand the number one thing that you can do. Job number one is to love God deeply. Notice that when Moses uh, is, is speaking to the people, the word of God, look at what God says in verses five and six. He says, and you... Now, this is the key for generational success for the children of Israel. From now on, Moses, this is it. But he starts with you. He says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. It says nothing of your children yet. It says nothing of your grandchildren yet. You must love the Lord God deeply. What does it mean to love God deeply? What does that look like to love God deeply as a man in particular? Well, many times throughout the Bible, when it speaks of wisdom, again, that's what we're trying to find. When it speaks of wisdom, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning or the foundation of wisdom. It says this in Job. It says it in Proverbs. It says it in the Psalms. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of... Now, listen, this is not talking about fear in the sense of creating anxiety and worry of, of godly retribution and divine judgment on you. That is not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a divine awe. It is an incredible uh, reverence uh, of respect and wonder of God. That is the fear of the Lord. And when you walk in the fear of the Lord, that God is good and powerful. He is sovereign. And I'm in awe of him. I have a reverential understanding or fear of this God. Not, not out of, uh, of worry and angst, but out of awe and wonder. That is actually the qualification for you to actually pass anything on is that it has come to you first. When you deeply love God, you will keep his commandments. You see, here's the problem. We got so many people trying to keep commandments. They don't love God first, and it doesn't work that way. You can keep a command. How many of you know? You can buckle your seatbelt and not pay taxes. <laughs> you, you can keep a law and not love the lawgiver. You know that, right? I mean, I mean that, that's what the Pharisees did. They kept the law better than anybody, but they didn't love God. They didn't even recognize God. When he came in the form of Jesus, they crucified him. They actually hated the lawgiver and obeyed the law out of resentment and pride. And you can do that all day long. And, and you'll never have a relationship with God that way. But if you will love God, guess what? The Bible says, Jesus said in John 15, 16, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Love is the requirement. Love me deeply. Have a, a reverential respect and awe and wonder of me. And guess what? All the laws, you don't have to worry about keeping them. You keep them quite naturally. They'll flow out of you. And here's the deal. Our kids need fathers who love God unashamedly and wholeheartedly. You must be ruled by the same authority that you want your children to be ruled by. If you're ruled by any other authority in your heart, and you'll rule with that, and your children will grow to resent you. They won't love you. They will, they will learn to do what you have done, which is to follow the law and not love the lawgiver. So you must love with the same authority that you are surrendered to. Authenticity is what your children need to see. You cannot teach the values that you wish to shape your children with if they do not govern your own life. So dad, here's the question just to ask you and just to, just to sort of contemplate today is, is your life ruled by the wisdom of God? Do his instructions and desires flow from an obedient heart or simply from your head? In other words, are you actually living in wisdom or are you just passing along wise statements? You have to be authentic. It's got to flow from your heart. Now, this is not the sexy one on the list of job descriptions, but it's the most important one because from it comes the second and only the second 
coming from the first. And here's the second rule. Teach your sons diligently. Okay, this, this is it. Love God deeply. Teach your children, your sons and your daughters diligently. Deuteronomy 6, going back to verses 7 and 9. Look at the emphasis here. He says, repeat them again and again. Talk about, listen, this is only after they have consumed your heart. This is only after you love him, not just with your head. Listen, not just with your hand can you love your children. You have to love God with all your heart, and then you can love your children with more than just your hand of rebuke and your words of instruction. He says, repeat them. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're in the bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. We have to pass this along. Fathers, let me tell you, you and I are uniquely equipped, qualified, and called to pass along wisdom to our children. In fact, Paul says it this way in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 4. He says, one of the roles of fathers to their children is to, look at this, bring them up. Did you know there'll be a day where you can't bring your children up any longer? Did you know that? Some people think, oh, they're always my kids. They always came from you, but they're not always your kids. You have about 12 years. Did you know that? 12 years, and then the concrete is formed. He says, bring them up. Not when they're 15, 16, 17. That's, that's, I hate to say this, but that's a little late. Bring them up with the instruction and the discipline, look at this, that comes from the Lord. Now, this is not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it is because we live in a culture that pushes back against this. And many of us, again, we're not raised in homes like this. But I want you to understand that Paul is telling us that we have and can form our children in instruction and discipline that comes not from this culture, not from Instagram parenting, not from a culture who seeks to take the place of God, but from the very words of God. First of all, put in your blank, we're to bring them up in discipline. Now, if you're a young parent here, listen, lean in, because I'm going to give you better, more wise, and everlasting advice than any psychologist could possibly give. No offense to the great psychologists that are here. But I want to tell you, this is, this is where Parenting 101 comes from. So how many of you remember some of the wise words of wisdom that your father gave you when it came to discipline? Things like, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. You remember that? Just wisdom. Boy, I'll slap the taste out of your mouth. Don't you talk to me like that. Hey, if, if, you want, if you want to do your own thing, you live in your own room. But while you're living in my house, you're going to do what I say. You know, just, just <laughs> wisdom protruding out of fire. Y'all remember those words. Those are not wisdom. This is wisdom. And it actually comes from St. Patrick himself. Never raise your hand when disciplining your children because it leaves your groin unprotected. That's wisdom. If you're going to pass something along, man, make it have value. You know, I'm being facetious. Uh, the reality is timeless wisdom when it comes to discipline comes from God's word. Now, listen to me and tune in. If you fell asleep, come back to life here because I'm going to talk to you about this. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, look at this. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. I want you to understand, I don't care what pop psychologists or what this culture or again, Instagram or anybody's telling you as a young parent, listen to me. Discipline is an incredible tool by which God gives us during the formative years to care for and love our children. Let me give you some more scriptures and then I'm going to tell you why and how it's so important. So stay with me. Hebrews 12, 11. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful and not just for the child. How many parents would say, it's painful for me. And it's supposed to be. But afterward, there will be a peaceful 
harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. This is how you train a child when they are young. And there is a peaceful harvest of right living. You know, I'm convinced that people don't want to discipline their children for two reasons. They are more worried about what others will think of them than they are about what God's word says, or they're more fearful that their kids won't like them than they are fearful of the awe and the wonder of God's word in their life. That's just a reality. But let me not stop. Let me give you another one. Proverbs 22, 15, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. They were born into sin, friend. I don't care how cute they look. I don't care if you would eat their spit up. They're so precious. Because, you know, somebody's just like, oh, the children, they're, they're full of sin. He calls it foolishness here. But look what happened. But physical discipline would drive it far away. Let me keep going. Proverbs 23, 13. Don't fail to discipline your children. They won't die if you spank them. Physical discipline may very well save them from death. Now, again, I want you to understand, I'm not for just physical discipline. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is we live in a culture that tells you to take everything that God's word says, take it off the table because it's just too harsh. It's just, it just won't fit with where we are. This is God's word. It always fits. You need to reassign your life around it rather than trying to change it to fit your life. This is God's word. And here's what will happen. This is wisdom. It's in your handout. Behaviors you refuse to discipline out of your children you will ingrain in your children. Did you hear me? Now, listen to me. This is why it's so important. Not physical discipline, but discipline as a whole. This is why it's so important. Your children are like concrete that is dry. Anybody ever poured a post and, and you set in a fence and you poured the concrete in there and it's wet? You know that your children's mind and their soul and their thoughts and their emotions and their view of life and their perspective of God and their perspective of you and their perspective of authority and their perspective of everything that matters is being formed like concrete that is drying after being poured. You only have a few years. You hear me? And if you put that post in there, the next thing you do is you put the, the, the level on the side and you make sure it's even. You put the level on the top, make sure it's even. Because you want it done right. Now, what happens when you go in and get a lemonade and that thing has moved because of the wind and dried? You got no other choice. You're going to have to break up that concrete. You're going to have to crush the concrete that is hardened so that you can repour it. You say, what are you getting at? Your children will be disciplined. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of by whom. And if you don't in the formative years, while you have them under your influence, discipline them in the way of the Lord, what will happen is their future wife will. Their boss will. This world will discipline them. They will break them. They will crush the form that you left undone. They will crush it, grind it up, and re-pour it. And it'll be done by people who don't love them necessarily or have their best interests. And they will grow to resent you. They'll resent the fact that you passed off to other people into a, a hateful world, a job that was alone yours. Now, I'm screaming a lot just because, man, this is so important for you and your family. It's important for your children. Regardless of what this world tells you, discipline is healthy and good for you and your children and their children. Now, if you can't discipline your children without being angry, if you, if you don't know better than to not spank them when you're tired, or if you're simply spanking them, physical discipline, I'm talking about, if you're doing that just for behavior modification, you need to stop spanking until you can understand something. You can't spank when you're angry. You don't do it when you're tired. And if that little swat to the bottom doesn't tie to an instruction that you've already given them, that this is just a, a reminder, then what will happen is 
They don't tie that to a memory of a brutal, angry father. You hear me? So discipline is used by God as a way to love and care for your children so that this world who doesn't love them won't crush them under the discipline that you did not love them with. Amen? That was really good. Hope you got that. Here's the next thing is instruction. We'll close real quickly, but discipline and instruction are tied together. If you just discipline, you don't instruct, you missed it. Discipline is just a way to drive them into greater wisdom. And so our job is to instruct. The book of Proverbs, again, is one of the greatest places to go to teach your children. Early on, as soon as my children could read, and as soon as they understood the Bible and the value of it and got water baptized, I told them, you need to read a proverb, a chapter of Proverbs every day, or at least a section of Proverbs every day. There are 31 Proverbs. There's generally 31 days in the month. Read one every day. And here's the reason why. It is the place to gain instruction and wisdom. Listen to some of these incredible Proverbs that are just so good for fathers to instruct their, t- their children. Proverbs 22, 1, look at this. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. That's a great way to borrow wisdom that you have surrendered your life to and then impart it to your children because that right there will keep them from the treachery of riches that entangle and suffocate their love for God. Proverbs 22, look at this. Don't befriend an angry person or associate with hot-tempered people or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. One of the greatest lessons we can teach our children are the influences that they get from the people that they hang out with. Well, the Bible gives you instruction and direction. You don't have to come up with it on your own. Dad, you're just saying that. No, God did. Oh, God said it? Yeah. Proverbs 3. My child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them, for they will refresh your soul. Couldn't be a truer statement written. Common sense will refresh your soul. It would disentangle you from social media and all the stupidity and all the air that's out there speaking nonsense. Common sense will refresh your soul, teach your children that. Here's the deal. I want to I close with this from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is the purpose of wisdom. He opens up the book of Proverbs with it. He says this, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise, Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. This world doesn't know what righteousness nor justice is. That's why they're all taking up the banner of all these uh, different entities and yelling justice. They have no idea what it is. Well, I I, I separated my child's mind from what the world says is justice through this truth right here. Seek the justice of God. Love widows and the poor. Give your life away serving. And you won't have to march with all these crazy entities. Because they go to higher education and they it's just it's not higher education at all, right? These proverbs will give insight to the simple. Who's the simple? The young. What's insight? Discernment. Knowledge and discernment to the young. Teach them to your kids while they're young while there's still that wet cement drying. To know, discern, and receive instruction. This is what the Proverbs are about. They are your parenting consultant. Years ago, my kids were graduating high school. I knew they were going to college. And I knew they would get a lot of head knowledge, but not a lot of wisdom. And I had already taught them about the Proverbs. I already taught them from the Proverbs, but I decided to write a devotional book using the Proverbs to them before they went. And this is my prayer at the end of that chapter, chapter one. Zach, Sydney, my prayer is that God's word will become that which I can no longer be, your instructor and accountability. It is my desire for you to know the wisdom and instruction that comes from God's word alone. 
For to know in your head alone is to risk forgetting that it is just cerebral experience, but to know instruction deeply, intimately, absolutely in your heart as an internal compass which directs your life and guides your decisions and informs your worldview is much greater than knowledge alone. I also pray that you would discern the words of understanding. That is, I pray God would give you the ability to bring to the surface a deeper understanding than what can merely be attained through words and the accumulation of facts. God is spirit and he has made us to be spiritual beings who are able to discern beneath the surface to deeper truths which anchor facts and give meaning to life. Thirst for this. Beyond that, I hope that you receive instruction from God's word so that your worldview is shaped and informed by his truth and so that no amount of knowledge or worldly wisdom can manipulate or persuade you to discount it. And so fathers, I, I wanna encourage you. I know it seems difficult. How do I raise a godly family? How do I lead my family? How do I reestablish this role that God has given me and will not give to anyone else? But here it is. Love God deeply and use his wisdom that is now in you through the love that you have for him, the fear of the Lord, to instruct your children and to discipline them in his ways, not yours. They're not your ways. They're his ways. But as you love him, they become your ways. Amen? And to pass them on. So fathers, if you would just bow your heads and, 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 and children and, and, and wives as well. I, I want to challenge you. You've been called and created uniquely to impart wisdom, discipline, and instruction to your children as well as to your children's children. And what I want to encourage you with is that you don't have to be perfect, but you have to daily submit to the perfecting power of the Holy Spirit and his word in your life and the amazing grace of Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm gonna ask your campus pastors to come and pray for you now, for your families and for your role as a father.